Uh, one little thing I would like to talk about today is we're living in a day which we have never lived in from the history of this world. There's never been a time like this where we're living in a world where the door to heaven is closed. Never before has this happened. We know that in the days of Noah, that it came a point as God used them in a mighty way to warn the world of his day about the coming flood. And you know, God in his mercy warned these people for decades and decades and decades about this coming flood. And we know without a doubt that God tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he would have warned the people of that day that there was a coming flood. And you know the account that they didn't listen. The day came where the door to the ark was closed. Remember, God, Noah didn't shut the door himself, God did. God shut the door on that day. And the flood came and they were all wiped out. Whether there were children on the outside of the ark, whether they're pregnant mothers or whatever age that person might be, whether it was a toddler or somebody who was 90 years old, God destroyed them all. And we know that God took full responsibility for destroying the world of Noah's day. God brought the flood upon them on that day. He closed the door to the ark. No one else was getting in. And so in our day, why it seems impossible that God will not close the door in our day? If, I mean, one of the big physical signs that we could see that we're at, at the end of the world, look at this um, gay marriage thing. It's no accident. I uh, was recently watching the news in Pennsylvania. They, the law was passed this week that they could get married and so forth. And it's, I think it's pending in 30 states. 30 more states is pending in that, and we can't stop it. God has given man up to his own rebellion. He's given mankind up. And you remember the account in Noah's day, everybody was doing right, was right in their own eyes. And what come right in their own eyes is sin. We're going to sin. And so we're living in a day where the door to heaven is closed. No one else is getting in. But we know that throughout the history of the world, you go back to Genesis, that God has been building his kingdom. Uh, when Cain slew Abel. So when Abel was saved, he was a true believer. Every true believer that's been saved throughout the history of the world, God has been building this kingdom. Spiritual, we don't know who's saved. We can't look at anyone and say who's saved. But God has been building this kingdom. Of course now it's spiritual. It's made up of people. He's elect from the foundation of the world. And he's been building this kingdom throughout time. And now this kingdom has been built. And now the door to heaven now is closed. And we can't open it. That door is closed forever. No one else is getting in. But I want to look at this kingdom God has been building throughout the time. But first, before I do that, I want to see who won't be there in this kingdom that he's been building throughout the history of this world. He's been building it. Every time uh, somebody became saved, if you're saved, you're in that kingdom. And now this kingdom now has been built. It's not complete, completed yet until the, the, physically the last day, judgment day, when True believers, they receive our glorified spiritual body. He destroys this universe, create new heavens and new earth, and there we will be with him forevermore in the new heaven and new earth. Now it's completed. But right now we're waiting for that day for our salvation to com be completed, and we know that God will complete it. No question about that. He will do what he says. He will complete this kingdom, but until then we have to wait. If you go to Revelation chapter 22, uh, look at some verses of those who won't be there. And there's many, many verses in the Bible uh, that speaks about this, those who won't be in this kingdom. Only those who are going to be there are those who have been elected from the foundation of the world, who have their sins paid for by Christ. They are the only ones who will be there. Our good works won't get us there. Nothing we do would ever save us. But in Revelation chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, there we read, Blessed are they that do his commandments. And we know that only the true believers are going to do his commandments. That they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs. And the unsaved people are known as dogs in the Bible. Dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. They won't be there. 
See, these are these people who will not be in this kingdom that God has been building throughout the history of this world. And let's look at Romans. Remember in Romans chapter 1, at the end of that chapter, God would list a whole bunch of sins. A whole bunch of sins he's listed there. In Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 32. I'm not going to read all these sins, but uh, let's start at verse 30 of Romans chapter 1. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So you could read the remaining things, but these are those who have not had their sins paid for, they will not be in this kingdom God has been building throughout the history of this world up until May 21, 2011. All the elect now are saved. Uh, let's look at another passage in Philippians. I think it's Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 17 to 19. Here we read, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which... Walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So those are they're those who are there who are enemies of the cross of Christ. They're bringing another gospel. If somebody during the church age, if they're bringing another gospel, it is not faithful to the gospel. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Unsaved men, they're enemies of Christ, and so forth. And he goes on in verse 19, whose end is destruction. So the end of these who are bringing another gospel and um, the, un, the wicked of the world, their end is destruction. On that day, day last day, the, when the Lord Jesus comes back, they're going to be destroyed. Whose end, who, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God goes on, he talks about he's going to change our vile bodies and fashion it like unto his glorious body. See, so we know that these will not be there. There's a, they are the enemies of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, um, turn over to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Verse 34, Psalm 37, verse 34 to 38. Wait on Jehovah and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land, which is the new heaven and new earth. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green fig tree. Yet he pass away, and lo, he was not, yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. See, see what's going to happen to the wicked? They won't be in this new heaven and new earth. They're going to be cut off. Their end is destruction. So we know that according to the Bible, that they won't be there, and the majority of the peoples who ever lived on this earth will be destroyed on the last day. It's an absolute fact. God even talks about there's, there is only going to be a tiny remnant that is truly saved. And we're living in a world today of seven billion. Maybe it's only that tiny percent is from throughout the whole history of the world, all the way back to to, to Abel. It's a very, very tiny remnant that is truly. Uh, the elect of God, and they're the ones who's going to be the inheritors of the new heaven and new earth. God is going to take away this earth from them and give it to the, the rightful owners of it, which are the true believers. Uh, let's look at Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2. I think it's Proverbs chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. For the upright shall dwell in the land, which are the true believers, in new heaven and new earth. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect 
shall remain in it, which are the true believers, because God has made us perfect. And he goes on, verse 22, But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. So you see what's going to happen to, the, to those who are, who are outside, which are God calls them dogs and so forth, that the wicked is going to be cut off from the earth. They're going to be rooted out of it. And we know that they will not be in the new heaven and new earth because their sins were never paid for. And in Psalm 9, Psalm 9, verses 5 to 7, Psalm 9, verses 5 to 7, Thou hast rebuked the heathen. You see how when you read this verse, Christ is speaking in the future tense as if it's already been completed. It's already been done. And it's, let's read verse 5 again. Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, as if they, as if they have already been destroyed. See, it's like when you uh, read in Revelation when Christ says, he's speaking about the new heaven and earth, it is done. It's not, you know, he's speaking in the future as if this has already been done by God. See, thou hast destroyed, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. You see, so and in verse 6, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities, and their memorial is perished with them. But Jehovah shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. So you see how he speaks in the future tense about the wicked. Thou hast done it. It's already as if it's already been done. But we know that God has to work it out in time. It's as if that when he saves us, he has already saved all his elect from the foundation of, of the world. That's when we were saved. We were chosen in him, the Bible says, from the foundations of the world. See, it's God's foreknowledge. He could do these things because God knows the end from the beginning. He knows all those who are his. He knows all of them because God is God. God is God. He knows these things. And let's look at uh, another familiar passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous, the unrighteous of all the unsaved, because they don't have the righteousness of Christ, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I can be plainer than that. No matter how good you think you might, that person might be and what they have done in their life, and done all these wonderful works, if their sins are not paid for, they are unrighteous. See? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. These are the ones who will not be there, no matter who that person is, where they came from, doesn't matter. And, you know, if you read verse 10, we know that before God saved us, some of us were like that. But we know that these will not inherit the kingdom of God. God has clearly declared that. And let's look at one last verse in Ephesians. I believe it's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. It says, Be therefore followers of God as their children. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become its saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, or covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So this is very clear to us. There are those who will not be there in, in, this, in this kingdom. They're not there, because now we know that the kingdom of all those who are, are, are saved are saved. They're the God, he's no longer saving people. And God clearly spells it out to us that only those who have had their sins paid for 
will be in this new heaven and in the earth. This is, is, is a fact. So let's. So we see those who are not who will not be in this kingdom that God has been building throughout the history of this world. There are those who will not be there, no matter what they believe, no matter what they have practiced throughout their religion or whatever they've been taught or told or whatever it is. The Bible clearly de declares to us that the only way that someone will be there, they had to have their sins paid for, they had to be an be elect of God. Other than that, no, and now we're living in a day where the kingdom of heaven, the door to heaven is closed. No longer anyone is getting in. When, and when God shuts something, who can open it? The doors close, and, and, and that's where we are today. But there are those who will be there. There are those who will be there, who God has declared that will, he has a people for himself. That will, they are all become saved now, they're there. We're just waiting for that God to complete his salvation plan. But let's look at some of these verses of those who will be there. But I think to do that, we have to go back to Genesis. We have to go back to the book of the beginnings, back in Genesis chapter 11. There back in Genesis chapter 11, we were introduced to this man called Abram at, at, at that time. God introduced us to Abram. His name was first mentioned, I believe, in Genesis 11. In Genesis 11, I believe his name was first mentioned in Genesis 11, starting in verse 26, Genesis chapter 11, verse 26, and there we read, and Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram. I believe this is where his name is first mentioned. Nahor and Haman. And now these are the generations of Terah. Terah lived, Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. And you, you read on. That's where I believe that his name was first mentioned. And let's read verse um. 28, and Haran died before his father, before his father, Tira, in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. And God goes on. Uh, let's read um, chapter 12, verse 1 of Genesis. Now Jehovah had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee all shall all the families of the earth be, be blessed. So Abram departed, and Jehovah had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So that's where we first read about Abram. And we know that God used him in a mighty way. And he's known as the father of all believers. And, and, and God has a lot to say about Abram. He's used him. Uh, look at chapter 13, verses uh, 14 to 18. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 to 18. And Jehovah said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land that thou seest it, see, see, seest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if any man can number the dust of the earth, the earth then shall thy seed be numbered. And then God told him to arise and walk through it, and so forth. But we know when you go into the deeper spiritual meaning of it, God had a plan that he was going to save a multitude of people from all over the world. I wasn't going to come into this kingdom throughout the world. They're going to, he's going to build this kingdom up from all nations all over the place. And God now has done so. This kingdom that he has been building, by, he started with Abraham and all these things. He's been saving people throughout the history of the world. Now the, the, we're living in a time now where this kingdom he has been building with people now has been completed. And God promised to give him the land and and God used Joshua and so forth to conquer these nations and God gave Israel this land. But we know all this have a deeper spiritual meaning which is pointing to the new heaven and the earth that God is going to create on the last day. And we know that um, God did fulfill the promise to Israel by giving them this land that he had promised. 
A lot of people don't think he did, but he did. Uh, God did do what he had promised, which given Israel the physical land, what we know that is a deeper spiritual meaning. If you turn over to Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 23, we're going to read there that God did fulfill this physical promise to, uh, to the children of Israel. In, uh, I think it's Joshua, chapter 23, verse 13. Let's start reading at Joshua 23, verse 13. Verse 13 of Joshua 23. Know for a certainty that Jehovah your God will, have no, will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land which Jehovah your God hath given you. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which Jehovah your God spake concerning you, all come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. So God did give Israel this land that he had promised them. They got the physical land that God said that he was going to give to them, but we know all this have a deeper spiritual meaning. And there's another verse in the Bible that even is more clearer than that, that God did fulfill the promise I've given Israel the land. I think it's in um, Nehemiah. It's in Nehemiah 9, I believe. Start reading in verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Thou even thou art Jehovah alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that therein is therein, and thou hast preserved them all. And the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Thou art Jehovah, the God who didst choose Abram, and brought him forth out of Ur the Chaldees, and gavest him the name Abraham. Thou foundest his heart faithful before thee, and made us a covenant with him to give him the land of Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Gergesites, to give it. I say to his seed, and has performed thy words, for thou art righteous. See, God did give them the land that he had promised them. He performed it. But we know all this have a deeper spiritual meaning, which this land that God has given to, to Abraham, this is a land that's going to be there, it tells us, forever. Which, if you go back over to Genesis chapter 17, we know that this earth is going to be destroyed on the last day, so he cannot be speaking about this physical land. I know a lot of a lot of teachings during the church age, during the churches, that many people have a gospel that is centered on this earth, that God is going to reign from, and he's going to set up an earthly kingdom and all these things, and, and reign for literal 1,000 years. That's not what God teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches. This world on the last day is going to be destroyed forever. Genesis chapter 17, here we read, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, Jehovah appeared unto Abraham, said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. You're going to be a a, a great multitude be become saved from all over the world. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations thou, uh, have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations, and kings shall come out of, thy, out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And you, we know that God is not speaking about this physical earth. It is the new heaven and new earth which is going to 
be when God created is going to be here forevermore. We know that this world will be destroyed on the very last day. But we know that all that God now has is going to be saved. They are saved. The door to heaven is closed. This kingdom that God is in building is made up of people. He has completed it. And now we're waiting for God now to finish what he said, which is destroy this universe and create new heavens and new earth. But he's been building this kingdom throughout time. He's been building it, building it. Throughout the church age, he used people to He's raised up faithful ministries like Family Radio. He used it, and he saved a great multitude right up until May 21. All the who were to be saved are saved. They're in this kingdom. They're there. They can't get out. They're there. And now we're just simply waiting for that time. When now, you want to say the second half is complete. And how wonderful that is. That is, and we know that we're, we're, we're here, we're at that time now, which the, that kingdom is completely built. Let's look at, um, how we know that, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, it's another familiar passage, because these are times that we have never seen before, ever since God has created this world, that now the kingdom, the door to heaven is, is closed. How terrible that is, that no one else is getting in. They could knock, they could beg like, the, you know, they could knock on the door, they could do whatever they want to do. God will not hear them. Remember the warning that went out? Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. The warning, call upon him while he is near. Because God is telling us this, there will come a time when the door to heaven will be closed. God was near to us at that time when the door was flung wide open. The door, the door, he was near, he was right there. And how, remember how the gospel call went out throughout the whole world? Never before have this world have experienced this, that the gospel went out in such a fashion. It's all God's doing. We can't take it, how he's moved in the hearts of people to put up billboards into uh, tracks and bumper stickers and t-shirts and God used the media. And never before, I've, I remember um, I was watching the news, CNN one day, and Somebody was complimenting Mr. Camping, said they have never seen anything like this before, that this message went out so far and wide. God used this medium, medium that God has opened up, the Internet, and he's moved in the hearts of many people to give financially and time and these things to get the gospel out in the whole world because the, the door was fastly closing. It was time was coming, and all this information came from the Bible that May 21 was Judgment Day. God, Christ appeared on that day. He shut the door. I don't know what time of day on May 21 it was closed, but now the door is shut. You see, the mercy of God, it's just like in Noah's day. As I said earlier, when I was start speaking, the gospel went out for decades and decades and decades to the people of, of uh, Noah's day. And the day finally came where, okay, now Noah, enter into the ark. God guided him in there, and he shut the door. So if only eight people of that, that day was saved compared to, from what I understand, is a couple million people. So why can't, I, why can't it do it in our day? Look at the world we're living in. God has given up mankind to his own, his own rebellion. It's, how can I, we, not, we not be at the very end? How, how can some say that nothing happened on May 21? How can they say uh, all is well? You know, I don't know where they see that from, but... I don't believe that what the Bible is teaching. Look at what happened on how God did, did it on a grand scale. He blew the trumpet by using his people to, to do so and many others to warn the world of this coming day of judgment. And now we're there, now the door has been shut. And many are trying to open it back up, which is never gonna happen. When he closes the door to salvation, he, just like the ark, when he closed it, and when these people realized what was going on, you know, it's, 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 it's mankind to run back to the ark to start knocking on the door. No one, no, open unto us. He, he, God never opened the door. All who was, as we know, on the outside of that, the ark, they perished. God mean absolutely what he says. The door to mercy, the door to salvation. There is no more grace. God's patience with, with, with the world has ended. God is only patient to us, word, the true believers. It, it has ended. The day of salvation is come and gone. All those who are 
to be saved are safely in the kingdom of God now. And those who are out, they're out. Let those who are filthy, let them be filthy still, as it says in Revelation. And those who are righteous, let them be righteous still. The door to heaven is closed. And many refuse to accept it. Well, they don't have to. But the fact is that it is closed. But in Ephesians chapter 1, God tells us that he saved us from the foundation of the world. Uh, like in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So, and it says, having predestinated us unto adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, and God goes on. That's when he saved all of his elect. But he worked out the salvation plan in time, and he's given us, during the church age, he's given us the true believers a fantastic job to go in the world with the gospel. And that now has been accomplished by God, and no longer the door of mercy is available, no more is the grace of God available. No, no more. It's, it's over. But the world continues like nothing ever happened. A lot of people believe that nothing happened on May 21. They have relaxed. All is well. You know, nothing happened. No, it was a spiritual judgment. As we discussed many times here at eBible, that it is a spiritual judgment. And you, the perfect example is that when you go back to to Genesis account, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they didn't fall down dead right then and there. Something, anybody will tell you that who is familiar with the Bible. Something happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Something happened to them. They didn't fall down dead right then and there, did they? No, they lived, Noah lived on to be 930 years. He didn't fall down of a heart attack. No, God could just take him out like that. He didn't. Something spiritually happened to man in the Garden of Eden. Anyone will tell you that something happened to them. Something happened to, to Adam and Eve, and we know this is a spiritual judgment. Why can't it be also in our day? You know, we have to, we can't trust our own understanding in, in the Bible. We have to listen to God's word and God's word alone. We can't take our human thinking out of it. You know, but there are many who believe that nothing happened on May 21. The calendar was wrong. All this information from the Bible was incorrect. But they have no answer for you. You know, well, so what did happen? They can't refute the information. They can't do anything. So I don't know how they could. I believe that May 21 was Judgment Day, and there was a spiritual judgment that came upon men at that time. Look at, I said earlier, look at, what, look at the world we're living in. Sin is just multiplying. When you have this, this gay thing going on, you can't stop it. You know, God has given man up to his own rebellion, given up to his own heart's desire, just like it was in the days of Noah. God gave them up. And this is where we are today. But look at some verses earlier that those who will not be in the kingdom of God and those who will be there, and those are only the elect that God has chosen from the foundation of the world, but he has saved them throughout this time. And God writes about it in different ways in the Bible, different ways, and he used... Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing when you see in the Bible that God has chosen a people for himself out of this human race who has nothing to do with them. And now we're here now where the door to heaven is closed. All those who, all the guests are there. The only other thing that we're waiting for is our salvation to be completed. God's going to change our bodies like unto his glorious body on that day. And, and he creates new heaven and new earth. And there we will be with him forever. And what true believers are going to reign over? I don't know, but God is God, and he could do all things. Okay, let's stop here, and uh, we're going to take a short break until probably about 11.30, and Chris is going to come up and, and uh, do his study. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we, we thank you, Lord, that, that salvation is sovereign. Salvation is of Jehovah. So glad, O oh Lord, that you have chosen the people out of this human race who have nothing to do with you. It's only by the grace of God that you have saved the people for yourself. And we're living in a time, O oh Lord, that we never lived in before, that there is no more mercy. The door to heaven is closed, and we're never before in the history of this world the door to mercy has been closed, but it is closed. 
And, oh, Father, salvation is your business, and you closed it. You're in perfect control of all things. And those of us who are saved, we simply wait upon you because we know, oh, Lord, that whatever you, whatever you is doing or, or have done is absolutely perfect. May thy perfect will be done in all things. And, oh, Lord, we, thy people rejoice that our salvation is almost completed, and yet there is a sorrow in our hearts because we know that our loved ones have nothing to do with the Bible and and you see we see this world where living in Sodom and Gomorrah where our righteous soul is vexed day to day as you see man shake his fist at you and go in their own way and 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 how sad that is but oh Lord we know that you are in control you are in control and you will fulfill all your promises and your commitments to your people we're headed towards that day that we will be with our Lord forevermore. And what could we possibly want more than to be with our Lord Jesus Christ forevermore? And Father, we ask that you will just have us to wait patiently upon you. Wait upon the Lord. And you, you will bring it to pass. You will do what you say you will do. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you will be with us the remainder of this day. Be with Chris as he brings forth the study and question and answer period. And as we pray, as we fellowship together, O oh Lord, that our conversations will be focused on heavenly things on spiritual things. And it's a blessing, O oh Lord, a great blessing that you have given to us that together we could fellowship together around thy word and listen to your word. Father, we thank you for your traveling mercies and for your guidance and watching over us this past week. And we pray, O oh Lord, could it be thy will that you will bring us back here together again and another Lord's day to look into your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.